Now, what I'm going to ask that these young people, they can get their caps on if they wish, and I'm going to ask them to come up this way, and uh, each one of them stop just for a moment here at this pulpit and share with us their name. Give your name, please. And tell us something about God's blessing on your life. Just something to brag on the Lord and his goodness. Now, many of them have been making speeches. Two of them have special speeches to give in the meeting tomorrow evening. That's not what this is all about. This is just something from your heart, impromptu, about God's goodness. And the Lord's been good to all of us, hasn't he? Uh, you parents and grandparents who hear of these young people, we want to thank you for trusting us with them. And we appreciate this senior class. So why don't we have you line up right over here. And uh, Mr. Whitaker and Mr. Misi will give you a hand. Good. And we'll listen and pray for you. Since you're in alphabetical order, that's the way we'll take care of it. Good. Good. Cheryl, come over here near me. You'd be the first to go. Somebody else stand on the edge of the carpet there just for a moment. It's hard for me to imagine when some of you ugly kids arrived and we saw you when you were born that you turned out this beautiful and this handsome. And uh, I had to convince most of your mom and daddies to keep you because they thought, I don't know if this will ever make it or not. But anyway, we're glad for you. Just have a little fun. But tell us what the Lord has done in your life and be brief about it. Some of you could go on and on, I'm sure. And, uh, but just give us just a word, but make sure you give us your name and then something about the goodness of God. Thank you. Um, my name is Cheryl Amon, and um, God's been really good to me lately. Um, he gave me a great Christian family and um, a great Christian church to go to. My name is Hannah Bowling, and I'm thankful that I got saved at Indian Creek Baptist Camp in 2008 Amen. Um, because I was raised in a Christian home, and um, I did get baptized at this church and made a profession of faith, but I didn't know the Lord in, in my heart, and I'm so thankful that um, we have a relationship, and it's been a journey, but it's been awesome, and I am very thankful I am saved. Amen. Hello, my name is Gage Brazel. I'm actually homeschooled under Temple Baptist Academy. I'm very thankful for my salvation, first of all. and uh, I got that settled when I was just a young boy. And, uh, I'm also just thankful for the Temple Baptist Academy and letting us homeschool under them and uh, giving us the privilege and um, honor to walk the graduation aisle with them. And just uh, thank you for that. Also, just want to ask you to pray for me as I'm going to the University of Tennessee next year to study chemical engineering. My name's Amanda Brock, and um, I'm thankful that I've been able to attend Temple Baptist Academy since K-4, <laughs> and um, I'm glad that I've made all the good Christian friends that I have, and that my family has supported me. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Timothy DeWin Burley. Um, I just want to thank God for being alive and standing here. Um, I want to thank God for my salvation. I want to thank God for the greatest family in the world back there. Uh, I want to name everybody. And um, I just uh, thank God for a great um, Christian school to go to. My name is Chelsea Carter, and I'm just thankful for all the friends that I've made um, ever since I've come here, since I was two and a half. And um, I'm thankful for my family. I know they'll always be there for me no matter what. And I would ask that you all pray for me as I attend ETSU for pharmacy in the fall. My name is Caleb Cooper. I've been at the academy for two years, and I'm just thankful for the Lord for giving me a good group of friends and a Christian school to go to. Amen. God bless you, guys. My name is Elizabeth Eaton, and uh, my family moved here about three years ago, and I've been homeschooled under um, Temple Baptist Academy. And I'm very grateful for my family and for godly parents that I can look up to and um, for great friends that God has given me that um, are a positive influence on me. Thank you. My name is Evan Eisenbeis, and I'm grateful for the Christian school and the, grateful, er, and the Christian friends that God has blessed me with. Amen. I am Jesse Harper, and I am thankful for the wonderful, quick friends that I was able to make here. They're all very friendly, and I'm just glad I was able to come to this school, even though I've only been here for two years. 
My name is Savannah Malin, and I'm thankful for the sacrifices that my parents um, allowed made to allow me to come to this school and to be homeschooled for the few years that I was able to, and the wonderful friends that I've made here. I'm Alex Provancha, and I'm thankful for my family who sacrificed to put me through Christian school and for the friends I've made this year. And for anyone who hasn't heard, we won state this year in soccer. <laughs> my name's Bennett Tassel. Uh, I'm very thankful for my salvation and my family and all the supporters I have. Amen. My name is Mountain. God's been all good to me all this year long, this year. Um, just thankful for my mom, uh, school, and the ministry of the church. Thank you. Amen. It's good to be near the end. It gives you time to think. <laughs> my name is Gabriel Trout, and I've, uh, <laughs> for as long as I can remember, I, I guess since second grade, a decade, I've been, uh, been here at Temple, and uh, it's been wonderful. You know, I'm just so thankful for my parents, you know, just the, the sacrifice they made just the other night, you know. Uh, it, it was just kind of, you know, the, the, they went to, it inconvenienced them to help me, but as a result, j just, just recently, it helped me, and helped me a lot, and you know, I'll, I'll never forget that, and also my friends, you know, they're such an encouragement, and another thing, you know, most people don't really mention, mention these people, but I think they're, they, they have a very special place in my heart, you know, Sunday school teachers have had a very, very great place in my life, you know, David Hemphill is one of the most inspirational people to me in my life. And I just thank him for his witness and just for, for his love for the Lord. Amen. And above, but above all these things, I thank the Lord. Because that's, you know, you know, all these things, they'll pass away one day. You know, there's, there's things that, you know, <laughs> it's just the Lord. Just the Lord. My name is Clay Varner, and uh, I'm thankful for God's long-suffering and uh, loving me despite of myself. My name is Gunnar Wolsey. Um, I want to thank God for allowing me to come to school here and providing for that and for giving me the family and friends that he did. Amen. Amen. <laughs> My name is Clarence Sexton, and I'm, <laughs> I'm thrilled to be a part of their lives. God bless them. And I'm glad most of them have lost their accent. And as long as they live, we'll know where they came from, right? That'll be good, won't it? <laughs> I have a message I want to bring to you in just a moment. But first, these ladies are going to come and sing. You pray for them. This is a big time in their lives. And I want to have a, my part in sharing in that big time, don't you? That God will bless them and use them in a very special way. So... Open your heart, allow the Lord an opportunity to speak to you. A man possessed by devils, his body wrecked with pain, the people greatly feared for bound by chains but at the name of Jesus the devils fled away the people were amazed to hear the madman say there is no
Jesus gave. King of kings and Lord of lords, Lamb that was slain, Jesus, Jesus, what a lovely name. There is no I'd like you to take the Word of God, please, and turn with me in the Old Testament to the book of Isaiah, to the 30th chapter. In Isaiah chapter 30, and we'll begin in just a moment with verse 19 of Isaiah chapter 30. I sincerely want to do all I can to help you, not just at this moment, but as long as I can. My high school principal said to me that if you can develop a handful of faithful friends in a lifetime, that would be a great treasure to you. And I thought, look, I have all kinds of friends <laughs> everywhere. He was telling me this when I was a senior in high school. But I found that what he said is true. As you journey through life, those faithful friends we are friendly with one another. Folks are friendly with me. But they are those intimate, faithful friends that you cherish for a lifetime. And I want to help you. Others want to help you. And may God open our hearts to the help he wants us to receive. The Lord speaks to us through his word. He also speaks to us through other Christians. And he speaks to us through circumstances. When you have your Bible open here to the 30th chapter of the book of Isaiah, God is dealing with his disobedient people. And you'd think perhaps if you've disobeyed that it's all ruined. I want you to make the right choices at the right time and not have to clean up one mess after the other all of your life as I want for my life. But you're going to find that God makes promises to his rebellious people here. And he will keep those promises. A portion of this is a millennial promise that God is going to bless his people as he returns them to their land. But we'll work our way through most of this chapter and I want you to listen carefully so we can do it as quickly as possible. The Bible says in verse 19 of chapter 30, For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. Thou shalt weep no more. He will be very gracious unto thee at the voice of thy cry. When he shall hear it, he will answer thee. And though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner any more, but thine eyes shall see thy teachers. And thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way. Walk ye in it. When you turn to the right hand, and when you turn to the left. 
Which way? Which way? I want you to think about that question. Which way? Which way? I've spoken to you young people recently about the gates God gives us in our body. Remember, he made us spirit, soul, and body. You're more than a body. More than a body. So much more than a body. You're spirit, soul, and body. In your spirit, you have a conscience. You need to work all of your life trying to have a conscience void of offense, living in obedience and delighting in obedience to God. In your spirit, the Lord dwells. If you've been born again, regenerated by His mighty power, the Holy Spirit dwells in you. The Bible says you are indwelt by Him. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So that's something that needs to be cared for. That's how you worship God in spirit and in truth. In your soul, you have intellect, emotion, and will. Intellect. God gave you that. And that intelligence, that intellect, is where you receive fact, truth, ideas. But in there also in your soul, he gave you emotion and will so you can commit your life, all of your, all of your being, to what God has given you to do. And in our bodies we have what we call five senses, or may we say five gates. There's an eye gate. We don't just see with the eyes, we see through the eyes. And I want you to try to remember that because what we see through our eyes affects our spirit and our soul. We have ears, some people say, with which to hear, but it's not just ears to hear with, it's ears to hear through. It's a gate through which things come and affect all of our being. Our taste is not just to taste with, but to taste through. Our smell is not just to ta smell with, but to smell through. And our, our touch is not just to touch with, but to touch through. If you were just a body, and I happen to be just a body, we may say that we see with our eyes and hear with our ears and smell with our noses and taste with our mouths and touch with our hands, but we are not just bodies. We are eternal beings God created. You must never forget that. You may study the chemical elements of the body and someone tell you they consist of this, that, and the other, but you're much more than that. As a matter of fact, no one can completely understand this creation God has made, this crown of His creation. We're fearfully and wonderfully made. And amazingly, new discoveries are being made about this being, the spirit, soul, and body. And God wants to direct us. He created us and He wants to direct us. And so He uses these gates to speak to us, to deal with us. And all through life we ask which way, which way. Before I get into this passage, I want you to hold your place here and turn with me to the Gospel according to John, the 14th chapter, to a very familiar verse because this is the answer. This is the answer. The Bible says in John chapter 14 and verse 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth and the life no man cometh unto the Father but by me. I am the way. So every time you're faced with direction, always choose the Lord. Always choose the Lord. Try to personalize the way. Which way would please Him? Which way would He decide for me? What is it God has for my life? And in choosing that way, it will always require the walk with truth. No greater joy than our children walk in truth. It will never be a lie, never be deception. It will always be following out the truth. It will always require faith. It requires faith. We don't live a sight life. And I hope your faith grows. It will grow as you're, you're tried. Things don't make sense always to you. And uh, I, I think God gives us faith, of course, but I believe the same thing you do about that. But the truth of the matter is, not only does God give us faith, that faith must be exercised. So when decision times are to be made, there's this element of faith, believing God. 
And remember that faith is defined as the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. As a matter of fact, that's what some people say, most people say. But it's really demonstrated as we look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Don't make something complicated out of it. What does God want? Look to Him. Look to Him. And when you find the right way, it'll bring the best out of you. The curse of most people is mediocrity. I think often when I talk to the people who work here with me and think about the things God's given me to do with my life, the most frustrating thing in my life, the most frustrating thing in my entire life is to think about where I am and where I really could be had I believed God and trusted God for all I should have believed Him and trusted Him for. Even my devoted friend, Dr. Lee Robertson, 97 years of age when he left this world, said to me not long before he departed, I wish I had had more faith and believed God for greater things. I knew that greater things could have been done. And I would say the path he chose brought out the best in his life. But he knew there could be more. And you may think you've had a little twist or turn that's thrown you off course. You may imagine that you've had a little delay in something and you haven't really gotten into it yet. But you'll live to discover that was part of what God was doing to work in your life to help you find His way. His way. Now I'm going to give you some very simple things from this Bible text. And it's for all of us, so I want you to write them down. Would you please? When we come to this 30th chapter of Isaiah, if you have your Bible open there, if we're going to find the way God says this is the way, walk in it. If we're going to really know God's way, if you're concerned about God's way, there must be a waking, a waking. We must be awakened. It must be waking. Wake up. Wake up. Most human beings are sleepwalking all the way to the grave. Wake up. As I said earlier, I, I'm challenged about what I could have done already and have not done. Wake up. Be alert, wide awake to what God wants for your life. And this passage in chapter 30, beginning with verse 1, Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me, and that cover with a covering, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin that walk to go down into Egypt and have not asked at my mouth to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. Can you imagine? God says to his people, why do you turn to the world? Egypt is always a picture of the world. Why don't you seek my counsel? You see, all of us have to wake up. Are we never going to follow what God wants. And someday when we look back in retrospect across our lives, and by the way, it all passes much faster than you ever imagined. But even if it was slow going, the foundation you take for your life will determine so much of the direction you follow. God help us. Verse 3 says, Therefore shall the strength of Pharaoh be your shame. And the world proves that every day with people who have turned to the world for all they want and think they need and it only turns out to be their shame. And the trust in the shadow of Egypt, your confusion. Just in my lifetime, I could rehearse to you the stories of many famous, very popular people who were applauded by so many millions whose lives went to total ruin. May God help us. We must wake up. Look in verse 7. For the Egyptians shall help in vain and to no purpose. Therefore have I cried concerning this. Their strength is to sit still. Now go, write it before them in a table and note it in a book that it may be for the time to come forever and ever that this is rebellious people Lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers, See not, 
and to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things, speak unto us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. He says, my people say to the prophets and those that are the seers who could foretell things that I have empowered to do so at that particular time, they say, don't tell us about it. I don't want to hear about it. Don't, don't prophesy to us truthful things. Lie to us. Tell us about soft things. We don't want to be disturbed. Well, I'm going to tell you, we live in a disturbing hour of human history. The other day I read something that's fascinating. I shared it with you months ago, I think, but I just can't get over this. I don't know how they found out such a thing and how they survey such a thing, but this generation in which you live is supposed to be the most unhappy generation in American history. The most unhappy generation in American history. Now, we would have said just months, months, months ago that this was the generation that had more than any American generation ever had. At the same time, the most unhappy. Is there a message in that for all of us? If we're going to know God's way and walk God's way and do things God's way, there must be a waking. Look what the Lord says. When they say, give us smooth things, deceive us. Verse 11, get you out of the way, turn aside out of the path, cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. We don't want God in our lives. Imagine. We don't want to hear about God, be reminded about God. We want to stamp God out of our thinking. We want to chase God out of our existence. We want to be free to do whatever we please to do. God is listening to his people say this. Wherefore, verse 12, thus saith the Holy One of Israel, because you despise this word, and trust in oppression and perverseness and stay thereon. Therefore, this iniquity shall be to you as a breach ready to fall, swelling out in a high wall, whose breaking cometh suddenly at an instant. He shall break it as the breaking of the potter's vessel that is broken in pieces. He shall not spare so that there shall not be found in the bursting of it a shared to take fire from the hearth or to take water with all out of the pit. God says if you don't wake up, you're going to be standing neath a wall that in a moment is going to fall on you. And the tragedy of the thing is it will be so destroyed there won't be a piece of it remaining to do anything with. God says to his people, wake up. Wake up. Your life does not have to be lived with so many regrets. Be awake to the Lord, alive and alert to what God wants. I yielded my life to Christ as a 17-year-old. I was a junior in high school. I only regret I didn't do it earlier. As an 18-year-old, when I walked across the platform to receive my high school diploma, I'd given my life to God. I put in my yearbook. We all have a will and testament in the yearbook. God gave me the grace to say, whatever God wants for my life is what I want. I'm not saying that to you because I did it. I'm saying that to you because I realize as a young person, God will deal with you if you'll allow him to do it and wake you up. He will wake you up. If we're going to know which way, there must be a waking. There must be a waking. Then secondly, would you write this down? There must be a waiting. A waiting. Verse 15. For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest shall ye be saved. In quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. And ye would not. But ye said, No, for we will flee upon horses, therefore shall ye flee and 
We will ride upon the swift. Therefore shall they that pursue you be swift. You see, you can't outrun God. You can't hide from God. Years ago, I went over to Dr. Bob Bevington's place at the Knoxville Baptist Tabernacle. I was very, very young, and he had preachers who were all over 80 years of age to preach in a meeting. Imagine that. And I thought, what do these old guys have to say that's going to be worth hearing? In that meeting, one of the men I heard was a man named Billy McCarroll. He was pastor of the Cicero Bible Church in Chicago for many years. He was somewhat of a witness. He was there not long after that on the St. Valentine's Day massacre, the massacre, the gang's massacre in the St. Valentine's Day massacre in Chicago. I listened to him intently. I still remember his message. It was on the resurrection of Jesus and the evidences of the resurrection of Jesus. And he went right down the line from memory and gave every reference to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the proof that Christ rose from the dead. What a powerful sermon. Now, that must have been around 1972 or 3. Well, in 1987, my wife and I were knocking on doors in Patterson, New Jersey, a long way from Chicago and a long way from Knoxville. And uh, there were certain types of people, immigrant people, who spoke different languages living on this particular street. And we knew we were in an area where we would meet everyone coming to the door from that particular nationality of people. But all of a sudden, this young girl, Caucasian, blonde-headed, English-speaking, came to the door. We stood at the door and I, I said to her, my name is Clarence Sexton. I'm the pastor of the Madison Avenue Baptist Church in Patterson, New Jersey, here in this place. And we're giving gospel literature, talking to people about knowing Jesus Christ as Savior. Young lady, do you know the Lord Jesus as your Savior? And she gave a nod somewhat reluctantly. And I said, by the way, what is your name? And when she gave her name, she gave her last name as McCarroll, just a young girl. Strange thing, God popped into my mind. That night I was sitting in the Knoxville Baptist Tabernacle listening to that short, stout-looking preacher by the name of Billy McCarroll, and I remembered his message, and I just happened to say, with no idea there was any relationship, could you possibly be related to a preacher in Chicago that's already in heaven now named Billy McCarroll. She began to weep. And she said, I see I can't hide from God. I'm his granddaughter. And I've gotten away from all of that back there to be free from it. And God has found me. Listen. You can't outrun God. It's impossible. We bought the boys some pants at a store in Paramus, New Jersey. And the waiter, uh, the, the, the clerk was waiting on us and she spoke with a strong southern accent. And I said, uh, I'm a pastor. This is my wife and let me give you this gospel track. We'd like to invite you to our church and talk to you about the Lord. She said, I moved here from Louisiana. I'm far away from God. I'm running, trying to hide from everybody and everything. But before we left, she said, I'll be there. And sure enough, the next Sunday, she was sitting in the audience, and when the invitation was given, she was the first person down the aisle, got right with God and became a great worker in our church. I'm saying, no matter how swift a horse you jump on, no matter how fast you go, how furious you are, you'll never outrun God. That's what God said to these people. You get on a swift horse, a swifter one will be after you. One thousand shall flee at the rebuke of one. At the rebuke of five shall ye flee. To be left as a beacon upon the top of a mountain and as an ensign 
on a hill. God says, I'm going to let you become an example. And then he says, and therefore will the Lord wait. Can you imagine God says, I'm going to wait. We men know what it's like to wait, don't we? Until someone else is ready. We wait. Now, Evelyn, God bless her hearts, had to wait on me a lot. But God said, I'm going to wait. I can't imagine one of the kindest, most wonderful things I've ever read about God is he says right here, I'm going to wait. Well, Lord, I'm in a hurry. God says, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait. He may wait till you've wrecked and ruined more than you ever planned to wreck and ruin. You may get what you want, but you've gone further than you ever believed you'd have to go to get it. But God says, I'm going to wait. Therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you and therefore will he be exalted. That he may have mercy upon you for the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are all they that wait for him. God says, I'm going to wait until you're willing to wait for me. Don't you know God can go faster than we can go? But we can't handle what God can do until we've waited on him and we are able to receive it. God says, I'm going to wait. I've often thought what God wanted to do, but I wasn't ready for him to do it. What God wanted to give me, but I wasn't ready to receive it. What the Lord had for us, but I wasn't ready to have it. And God is dealing with his rebellious people. He says, you must wake up. If you're going to know my way, you must wake up and you must wait. And when I see that you're waiting, I've been waiting, God says, for you to wait on me. And now he's ready to work. There must be waiting. Would you write a third thing down? There must be walking. Walking. This speaks of companionship. We're back to verse 19. For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. Notice now what happens. Thou shalt weep no more. He will be very gracious, very gracious unto thee at the voice of thy cry. What tenderness is here. When he shall hear it, he will answer thee. Would you put yourself in verse 20? And though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner anymore, but thine eyes shall see thy teachers. God says, everything's gone, but there's going to be still someone there to instruct you. Isn't it merciful of God to leave someone to instruct us. You may find it in the most unlikely place. But someone's there with God's word for you. I know a family very well who prayed for one of their children. It seemed like they couldn't help this child, but they could pray. And this is the way they prayed. Lord, bring someone into this person's life that is inescapable. Bring someone into this person's life that's inescapable in a job situation or whatever that will speak to them on a daily basis about you and work through that person to do what it seems is impossible for us to do at this moment with that child. And I want you to know those people would testify and tell you that's exactly what God did. They could go through a list of things they lost, a list of things that were messed up, a list of things that were off track. But there was always a teacher, someone to speak the truth when that person was ready to hear it. I just want to say hallelujah, what a Savior. What a God we have to deal with us the way he does. 
He goes on to say, and this is the beauty here, verse 21, And thine ears shall hear a word behind thee. Why behind thee? Because the person has his or her back turned on God. God speaks from behind. The back is turned on the Lord. But God speaks. Thine ear shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way. Now there's been a waking up and waiting. And God says, This is the way. We listen. He says, walk ye in it. When you turn to the right hand, when you turn to the left. Can you imagine that the creator God is that interested in guiding your life and mine? The creator God is that interested in guiding your life and mine. You don't have to worry and fret. You say, I've already missed the boat. No, you haven't. No, you haven't. God has another boat coming around the bend. You haven't missed it. You say, I blew it. No, you didn't blow it. You didn't blow it. He said to Peter, 70 times 7, Peter, forgive him. You didn't blow it. Oh, you say, I may have blown it once. Look, God's able to reach down and work again and again in your life. I don't want to mock his mercy, but I don't want to praise him that his mercy is anew every morning. Amen. Give him all the glory. So all of your life you say, which way? Which way? Which way? Jesus. Always choose Jesus. It's going to require that you walk in the truth. It's going to require faith. It's going to bring the best out of you in struggles. But if you're going to know his way, you must be awake. You must be waking. You must be waiting. Then there's going to be walking with the Lord in the path he chose for you.